A very good evening and a warm welcome to all our viewers. I'm Dr. Shatil from the clinical engagement team at DocPlexus. Welcome to a brand new session on the DocPlexus, where we are, where we'll be talking about COVID-19 sequelae. So COVID-19, as, as we all know, uh, has been a major pandemic resulting in substantially substantial mort mortality and morbidity worldwide. Of all the individuals affected, about 80% had mild to moderate disease, and amongst these with severe disease, 5% developed critical illness. A few of those who recovered from the COVID-19 developed persistent or new symptoms lasting weeks or months. To discuss this post-COVID syndrome, we have with us three speakers who are going to share their fair share of experience. I would first take the honor to introduce the chairperson who, who would be uh, Dr. Pad Dr. Padmashri or uh, Dr. Ashok Gupta. Dr. Gupta is an eminent plastic surgeon with over 25 years of experience. He holds many degrees and fellowships in the field of plastic surgery, anesthetic plastic surgery, microsurgery, and laser surgery. He has represented India for eight years as the National Secretary of India at the International Society for Aesthetic Plastic Surgery. Welcome, uh, Dr. Gupta. We welcome you here. Thank you. Thank you. The, the speaker for uh, today is Dr. Rahul Bakshi, who is going to speak on the post-COVID-19 stress and diabetes. Dr. Rahul Bakshi is a consultant diabetologist at the Bombay Hospital and Medical Research Center, Mumbai. He is an alumni of the prestigious medical institute, CMC Vellore. He has worked at the Nick Ting Fong General Hospital, Singapore. Dr. Bakshi has also an academic background and is accorded with honors like the Long Service Award, Service Ambassador Award, associated with the Jurong Health Campus. He has been an active contributor to chapters related to diabetes in the API textbook of medicine and has several publications to his credit. Our second speaker for today, Dr. Avya Bansal, who is a pulmonologist and a somnologist at the Bombay Hospital and Medical Research Center, Mumbai. He is also the honorary chest physician for the Mumbai Police. He has many accolades to his name, including Sir Ratan Tata Scholarship, ICS ERS Travel Grant in Madrid 2019. He has nine national and international publications to his name. We welcome you both, Doctor. Our third speaker for today is from Ajman, Sharjah, Dr. Anish Babu. Dr. Anish Babu has been working as, the, as a dermatologist and venerologist in the Middle East since 1996. He has an extensive experience in treating skin, hair, nail, and sexually transmitted diseases. In addition, he is an avid educator and a regular speaker in the CME programs conducted across UAE and beyond. He is an active member of the Association of Kerala Medical and Dental Graduates and a former president of AKMG Emirates. We welcome you all to the session. Uh, Dr. Dr. Ashok Gupta, I would like you to take over the session now. Thank Please you. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Dr. Shrithil. Wonderful to have such a uh, wide audience from India and Middle East and welcome all the speakers. Uh, just a correction. Uh, uh, you know, thank you once again, uh, Dr. Plexer and Dr. Shittil. One correction that my experience is for 50 years, not for 25 years. <laughs> so I completed uh, uh, 50 years as a plastic surgeon. 1977, I graduated, did my MCS plastic surgery, and we are 22. So 50 years is a long journey. Things have changed. But as a plastic surgeon, what I have learned, how I am involved with the COVID, COVID-19 has really brought about vast changes in the research, vast changes in the teaching. And as you probably are aware, that majority of scientific developments are taking place on the either major war, like First World War, Second World War, or pandemics which happen in the Spanish flu and uh, now, uh, the COVID-19. 
some of the very very weird and unusual complications are being reported i mean in the editorial board of number of journals i get a chance to review some of the rarest of the complication which is so difficult to even imagine and i would just wanted to share that everything is possible like you used to say in our surgery that lipoma is one thing which can be found anywhere in every any swelling in the body lipoma should be one of the differential diagnosis same thing also stand for true for covid any complication any sequelae which you uh, don't find a reason you must find covid as one of the reason and two of the rarest complications which i have uh, reviewed the article one was the avascular necrosis of the head of femur it is so unusual a young lady uh, a doctor's uh, daughter in law she suffered from covid recovered from covid and post covid 6 months later she developed severe vascular necrosis of the head of the femur it is known to occur in young people it is known to occur following cortisone therapy but post covid is a very very unusual thing and probably that is the first case report in the literature which i have reviewed similarly i was also made to review an article of a necrosis of the little ring finger uh, following vasculitis severe vasculitis patient was admitted in icu had developed covid and because of covid immediate attention could not be given and that has led led to gangrene and the first the bluishness then the gangrene and the, when the surgeon tried to decompress the uh, the vessel by the time the damage was already done so it was also a not very old person a young person having severe vasculitis leading to gangrene of the finger post covid is some of the very very unusual complications and i am sure with the illustrious panel what we have they will be able to uh, review some of the common problems post covid and how to detect those problems and how to take care of your body health again the topic initiative was the vitamin d role of vitamin d and there is no doubt that vitamin d helps in all sort of uh, aspects of body healing and body defense mechanism which i am sure uh, you will have lot of questions to ask to the panelists with this few words i would like to invite our first speaker dr bakshi to give us the idea about the uh, the uh, how to tackle uh, post covid issues thank you thank you dr plexus and dr uh, uh, shithil once again and welcome dr rahul bakshi thank you sir for the kind words uh, i'll share my screen and we get started Next is uh, please. So I'll, I'll be speaking about post-COVID nineteen stress and IBTs. Actually, I am a radiologist in Bombay Hospital Medical Research Center. So, a bit of today's discussion, uh, we'll uh, we'll see what is post-COVID-19 syndrome. We'll see how stress can affect uh, various aspects of our body metabolism. We'll also discuss about new onset diabetes. In fact, that will be the core of my talk today. That new onset diabetes after COVID-19. How does it happen? What is the pathophysiology and pathogenesis? And uh, how many cases we are seeing and how we are trying to tackle them? And then uh, the inclusion part. So, for to start with, I'll just uh... yeah. There, there is some echo coming from your. This echo. So, just a moment, sir. Hello. Yes, sir. Is it better now? Shitil, can you confirm, Doctor Shitil? Is it better now, the voice? Uh, we can. We can hear you. Yes, uh, it's it's uh, audible and uh, yeah, there is a little uh, disturbance. 
but uh, i think it should be fine is okay that's okay that's better so i'll start with this uh, this new series from bbc news covid and this published in august last year i think covid 19 fears over shark bites in diabetes in india so let's have a look at this uh, patient mr vipul shah who was 11 days in a critical care battling covid 19 in a hospital in mumbai and uh, mr shah had book bbc this was published in the news item on bbc No previous history of diabetes. He was a Mr. Steroids, which uh, is commonly used to treat coronavirus infection. And uh, then later on, he found that uh, his glucose levels were high. And even after discharge, he was still taking medicines even after a year of uh, uh, having COVID-19 infection. And yeah, uh, they also quoted me. I was contacted for this, and they quoted me. So the what actually is why is that COVID nineteen? This was last year in August, so almost one year now. Why is that COVID nineteen could trigger tsunami of diabetes in India after the pandemic is over? So almost eighty nine percent of the patients I have seen now have been history of diabetes in the past, and what COVID nineteen continue to have high glucose levels even after recovery and require medicines. Some have borderline diabetes, which is pre-diabetes, and this is for and others are managing with medicines even a year of recovery. So it's post-COVID syndrome. So post-COVID syndrome is defined uh, uh, for the first time by Greenhall as a COVID-19 associated illness extending for more than three weeks after the onset of symptoms, and chronic COVID-19 as persistent symptoms extending beyond 12 weeks after the onset of symptoms. And recently, uh, Amita et al. also proposed uh, to the definitions outlined above that for patients who remain hospitalized at three weeks after symptom onset, the post-acute period starts when the patient is discharged from inpatient acute care. So what are the manifestations of post-COVID syndrome? So this is again very common. We see a lot of patients uh, who are discharged after COVID-19 or who have had COVID-19 at home. You know the COVID-19 uh, 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 course was uneventful, but then you know later on they can present these symptoms: so fatigue, dyspnea, decreased exercise tolerance, chest pain, gastrointestinal symptoms, olfactory and gustatory dysfunction. Again, very common. You know we we do see the, such patients uh, who complain of these symptoms: cardiac arrhythmias and persistently elevated blood pressure. Sleeping and mental uh, disorders and neurological complexes as well. So now we coming to uh, COVID nineteen and diabetes. So this is uh, one of the very early studies which was uh, presented from Wuhan. With the prevalence of comorbidities with COVID nineteen in Wuhan, China. So what they found was hypertension, uh, diabetes, respiratory disease, and cardiac disease were the commonly identified and very important risk factors for COVID nineteen. And if you see here, hypertension was uh, the commonest, around seventeen percent, and diabetes. Was at around eight percent of such patients. So, how does hyperglycemia occur in the setting of COVID-19? So, consequence of deterioration of pre-existing diabetes, new onset diabetes can be there. Stress-induced or iatrogenic due to substantial use of steroids. Uh, Gupta has just now mentioned the use of cortisone in such patients, which, which was uh, uh, required in a lot of our patients. And uh, sometimes in uh, uh, for prolonged duration, so within the context of severe COVID-19 infection, and it is also plausible that it might be a result of adipose tissue dysfunction and insulin resistance. And SARS-CoV-2, which is a virus uh, which is used to COVID-19, causes COVID-19, so it can trigger slowly direct beta cell destruction and beta cell autoimmunity. What is stress hyperglycemia? So stress hyperglycemia is defined as hyperglycemia that is spontaneously resolved. After overcoming the critical condition, so this is fairly common. You know, it's not like only related to COVID-19. Uh, in, especially in a hospitalized patient, you see any patient with infection, for example, you know, those who have diabetes or those who do not have diabetes, so any patient with uh, any cardiac event, any patient with any postural problem, any major stress going on, that can lead to a lot of hormonal changes, and that can lead to hyperglycemia. It's very very commonly seen. So three major factors for the rapid of stress hyperglycemia are increased hepatic gluconeogenesis by means of elevated hormones, peripheral insulin resistance, and uh, beta cell D differentiation. So these are a few of the uh, pathways which can lead to stress hyperglycemia. Is there new onset diabetes in COVID-19? So beyond the well recognized uh, stress response, new onset diabetes and complications including DKA, HHS. For which exceptionally high doses of insulin are warranted have been observed in patients with COVID-19. These manifestations suggest a complex pathophysiology of uh, COVID-19-related diseases. It is also possible that uh, SARS-CoV-2 
may uh, cause pleiotropic alterations of glucose metabolism and uh, lead to a pre uh, worsening of pre-existing diabetes or new mechanisms. And there are several precedents for viral cause of ketosis prone diabetes, including other coronaviruses that bind to ACE2 receptors. We discuss in the further slides as well how ACE2 receptors are important. But there have been pre precedences in uh, in the past as well where viruses, viral disorders, do lead to new onset diabetes. Greater incidences of fasting, hyperglycemia, and acute onset diabetes have been reported among patients with SARS CoV 2 pneumonia than amongst other uh, uh, non SARS pneumonias. And uh, this COVDI project have uh, established a global registry of patients with COVID-19 related diabetes. So this is a study going on with in collaboration with Cambridge uh, and Oxford universities, where uh, all over the world uh, we're contributing uh, patients with uh, COVID related diabetes. So uh, initial responses does show that there is a correlation, but I think we need more data uh, to, to be more sure about that. There's a bi-directional relationship uh, between COVID-19 and diabetes. This was a uh, paper published in Nature uh, showing a bi-directional uh, relationship. So in short, what does this mean? What is this bi-directional relationship? So basically, diabetes is associated with COVID-19 infection. So whenever a patient with diabetes gets affected or gets infected with COVID-19 infection, the, the, the prognosis is going to be poor in such patients. And COVID-19 patients with diabetes also have uncontrolled hyperglycemia and crisis requiring high doses of insulin. So that's another aspect to it. So long COVID and diabetes. So risk and burden of incident diabetes in long COVID, which is a cohort study, so cohort of uh, 181280 patients and 40% risk of being diagnosed with diabetes at one year. People in this other study uh, uh, with COVID developed diabetes. So what is this long COVID? Long COVID is a collective term to denote persistent of symptoms in those who have recovered from uh, SARS-CoV-2 infection. So this again is not only related to diabetes. Dr. Avia will be talking about the uh, uh, lung manifestations, which again, you know, can be very severe. We've seen a lot of cases uh, in the hospital uh, with Dr. Avia and, uh, you know, fibrosis and other uh, aspects. And uh, Gupta also mentioned about uh, many neurological cases, bone uh, involvement, you know, uh, avascular necrosis. So cardiac cases we've seen. We've uh, we've seen uh, cases with we've seen uh, gastrointestinal issues. We've seen skin issues. You know, olfactory issues. So it can. It is basically multi-system, and long COVID can uh, affect any and every system. So mild COVID and uh, type two diabetes. Incidence of newly diagnosed diabetes after COVID nineteen. So there was a twenty percent increase. Subsequent patients with over from mild cases of uh, COVID-19. So this was a retrospective cohort analysis of uh, around uh, 1,100 physician practices in Germany. Newly diagnosed diabetes in COVID-19. So a few aspects here. One is, as I discussed earlier, stress response to severe illness. Second, steroid use. So steroid has been used in a lot of our patients, especially those who had hypoxia, those who were admitted and uh, required uh, intensive care and ventilation. So steroid use again is important. Many patients did require it for an uh, extended period for recovery. Diabetogenic effect of COVID-19. So again, uh, uh, data is coming in. We are getting some evidence that COVID-19 by itself can affect the uh, ACE2 receptors and uh, can affect insulin resistance, can affect the beta cells. So it itself has a diabetogenic uh, effect. High insulin requirement required in uh, COVID-19 patients with diabetes. So that again is a bit unusual. We've, we've seen such cases over the past two, two and a half years since during the first wave, during the second wave in Bombay Hospital, patients requiring very, very high doses. The patients getting admitted with DK, HHS. You know, so these uh, complications, which are which are not uncommon in uh, in any infection, so to say, but in COVID-19, they were found to be unusually common. So we had a very increased frequency of these complications for patients requiring IV insulin infusion, Glucose levels of 500, 600, 700 milligram per cent, not at all uncommon. And in fact, I've seen a few uh, uh, above 1,000, 1,100 also uh, glucose, random glucose levels in milligram per cent during this COVID 19. So, very high glucose levels requiring uh, high insulin uh, doses. So, this has been a, a basic picture in uh, patients with COVID 19 who had pre existing diabetes or who had new onset diabetes during the course. So, why does it happen? So as uh, uh, we, we discussed, uh, SARS-CoV-2 causes COVID, the virus which causes COVID-19 by attaching to ACE2 receptors in beta cells of pancreas, 
it can cause acute impairment of insulin secretions. That's one mechanism where this virus, apart from uh, affecting the other parts of the body, affecting the lungs and so on, uh, there are H2 receptors present in the beta cells of pancreas as well, where it can cause acute impairment of insulin secretion. An organite study did show that uh, this virus can enter pancreatic beta cells. This virus also can injure the beta cells by triggering some pro-inflammatory cytokines. And COVID-19 can lead to defective insulin secretion and uh, insulin resistance. So these are a few mechanisms where uh, this virus uh, can affect the beta cells, can affect insulin secretion, can affect insulin resistance as well, leading to hyperglycemia and diabetes. So what does the data say? So I'll just talk about one uh, recent meta-analysis of eight studies where around 3,700 patients were showed uh, with a pooled proportion of 14.4% of newly diagnosed diabetes in hospitalized uh, COVID-19 patients. And newly diagnosed diabetes may confer a greater risk for poor prognosis of COVID-19 than no diabetes or pre-existing diabetes. So again, there have been studies around where uh, patients have been evaluated in the ICU and many of them had pre-existing or uh, uh, new onset diabetes, you know, apart from blood, uh, hypertension, apart from renal disease, apart from cardiovascular disease, diabetes came out to be a very important comorbidity in such patients. So, of course, greater risk of poor prognosis, greater risk of requiring ventilation in such patients as well. And COVID-19 patients with newly diagnosed diabetes should be managed early. So, this is, I mean, what, what we learn from this data, should be managed early and appropriately and closely monitored for the emergence of full-blown diabetes and other cardiometabolic disorders in the long term. So, patients may recover uh, at that point of time, but many times diabetes has been found to be persisting in such patients, uh, new onset diabetes, and uh, many, many of our patients, you know, they have to be advised accordingly uh, when, when to follow up, you know, when to monitor their glucose if they are requiring medications, to give them the medicines appropriately, there may be oral agents, insulin may be required uh, early in the course of the disease, and then with regular follow-up, with regular A1C monitoring, you know, uh, many times insulin may be stopped, but uh, the key is uh, diet and exercise uh, uh, advice so that the patients can, you know, work on, uh, work on them. So basically, when we talk about new onset diabetes and uh, COVID-19, it's not that, uh, you know, it, it, it uh, happened overnight. So patients may have been predisposed to it. We have to look at the background of a patient. So a few things here, you know, uh, with COVID-19, we've had lockdown. We've had patients, uh, we've had everyone who've been uh, staying at home, our diet, you know, to some extent had changed. Activity had gone down significantly. Though, you know, those patients who are in touch, who are, you know, facing diabetes, they were advised appropriately to walk around at home or whatever the city that had. But with uh, intensive lockdown in many parts of the world and India, you know, many patients, there was variance in many of our patients. So, pre-diabetes, you know, is very anyway, really common uh, and diagnosed. So many patients may have had pre-existing diabetes before getting COVID-19. So that again is a is a predisposing factor there. So pre-existing pre-diabetes, you get an infection, and you know uh, with, with that, with the effect of COVID virus, what we have seen in the previous slides, affecting the beta cells, insulin resistance, insulin secretion, getting uh, uh, to full-blown diabetes with a higher A1C. So that's one scenario. So that again, you know, uh, lifestyle changes and diet changes forms a very important part of diabetes management in all our patients. And even in these patients, when they are discharged after COVID-19, you know, diet and lifestyle and, you know, gradual once they recover, depending on how the lung function and, uh, you know, uh, uh, the other uh, cardiac function is, they should be advised appropriate walk exercise. Weight needs to be taken into consideration as well. Many of them are overweight and obese. So these are all basic things true for all cases of diabetes. But again, in such cases, it becomes very important uh, to emphasize on that. So it's not that if I give insulin or if I give them uh, one or two or three oral agents, uh, glucose levels will optimize. Diet and exercise and the lifestyle needs to be addressed so, so that that can be taken care of. So what are the most mechanisms for pathogenesis? So cytokine storm is, is one, you know, when we talk about the virus affecting the pancreas and beta cells. So cytokine storm with an exaggerated response. ACE2 receptor we've just discussed. Last system also can be involved. BP4 receptor has been shown to be involved in, in uh, uh, some cases with COVID-19 and the uh, process of pancreatic beta cells where we discussed it can affect the insulin secretion and insulin resistance. So this is a schematic diagram showing the bidirectional relationship between diabetes and COVID-19 and evolution of new onset diabetes. So starting from the left, uh, considering the sex age and presence of obesity, hypertension, coronary arteries and CKD. You know, and obesity can lead to inflammation and uh, already lead to a pro-coagulant state. And with COVID-19 infection with increasing severity, leading to new onset diabetes, 
or with pre existing diabetes leading to poor glycemic control. So, basically, a cycle. And with the virus affecting the beta cells, damage, insulin deficiency, and uh, cytokine storm from uh, stress leading to marked insulin resistance. And that can lead to the patient presenting with uh, uh, hyperglycemic complications like DKA and HHS. And that's a bidirectional relationship with COVID 19 affecting diabetes or leading to new onset diabetes and diabetes itself worsening the course of COVID-19. So, stress induced hyperglycemia. So, we had a slide on this uh, earlier. So, what, what are the factors here? Acute stress events. So, as I mentioned, any 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 uh, stress event, any infection, any surgery, any state can lead to elevation of stress hormones, including cortisol, growth hormone, adrenaline. And steroids used in uh, hospitalized COVID-19 patients again play an important role. And patient follow-up is uh, important to differentiate between uh, new onset diabetes and stress-induced hyperglycemia. These are all these are two different states. One is stress-induced hyperglycemia, which is present only transiently. You know, HB1C may be okay in both cases or normal in uh, stress-induced hyperglycemia. But such cases, once the stress is taken care of, you know, say for example, patient has a uh, myocardial infarction. Within a few days, the patient is treated, you know, uh, PTCA done, patient recovers, patient is mobilized and about to discharge. You will find that glucose levels improve in such cases. Whereas if it is a new onset of diabetes, A1C may be higher. And such cases, you know, even after resolution of the stress or the condition of the surgery uh, in the post-op state, patient recovering, the glucose levels may not improve. So in the stress hyperglycemia in critically ill patients with the subsequent in the systematic review and the meta-analysis, it was found that uh, almost 24% participants have stress hyperglycemia. And after follow-up for three months, almost 19% found to have new onset diabetes. So, you know, patients do not recover immediately in terms of uh, glycemia. They may require some uh, oral agents or insulin, you know, depending on the each case and how tight the glycemic control we are aiming for. Because, for example, if it's a post operative case, if it's uh, uh, someone with MI or some infection, we want to keep glycemic controls un uh, un well under control. I mean, glucose levels well under control. So, but then, you know, uh, monitoring the A1C levels, monitoring the glucose levels, you find out after a few months that's very difficult to wean off from the origins of the insulin or the diabetes medications what the patient is on and the patient has new onset diabetes. So, your new onset hyperglycemia diabetes factors include stress induced hyperglycemia. Pre existing diabetes, again, is uh, an important of pre existing other diseases. Uh, which include obesity, presence of hypertension, reduced physical activity, as I just mentioned, and effect of lockdown, mental stress in family history, use of steroids for management, COVID related complications also will play a role, and pancreatic beta cell uh, dysfunction. So, how do we manage or how do we screen uh, uh, such patients? So, all admissions, and this probably in today's age is true for any admission, you know, not only COVID 19. When a patient is admitted, should be screened for hyperglycemia with a glucometer uh, immediately on, you know, in, uh, on admission. And then at least two samples uh, should be checked in 24 hours. One should be a pre-meal or a fasting glucose and one should be a post-meal glucose. And if facilities are available, you know, we, we have a, a, a wide variety of facilities available for HB1C. It should be done along with the fasting and two hour PPBS next morning. And of course... Uh, Fasting glucose of 126 and above and A1C of 6.5 above is the diagnostic of onset diabetes. And uh, initial glucose testing in normal range. Release testing may be required at regular intervals during the course of the disease. So, of, uh, for people with uh, diabetes to prepare for COVID 19. So, people with diabetes should have contact information of healthcare providers. This is again very important, especially you know, when we go back, say, during the first wave in uh, 2020 March. You know, many of our patients did not have enough stock of uh, drugs. You know, in, there was an immediate lockdown imposed. So uh, those, those patients who had a contract of doctors, ultimately, I remember pharma companies did come forth with, with uh, you know, contacts where drugs were available all over India. So we were able to share that with our patients, you know, and drug, get drugs delivered immediately because, like, for example, insulin is such a drug or even oral agents, you know, if you stop them for three or four days or two days, even in type 2 diabetes, type 1, it is required for survival. You know, you cannot stop, you even stop for a, a couple of doses. But even for type 2, if you stop for a few days, you know, patient immediately will go into hyperglycemia, have uh, symptoms and risk of patient also increases. So it was important, again, to emphasize on our patients to have a stock of medications and supplies, even for monitoring glucose levels. So having glucometer, having the strip study, enough stock of uh, simple uh, carbohydrates for to treat the hypoglycemia events 
and again glucagon or uh, the other steps in case of cold asthma control so these were the these are the basic uh, like we call what we call as sick day management they should be ready with the information as well as the uh, uh, logistical support required and then management of uh, patients with uh, diabetes infected with covid 19 so we we did manage them with insulin uh, primarily but many patients when once they improve once their uh, saturation levels improve once they were not in the intensive care and getting ready for discharge we were adding on oral agents frequent glucose monitoring was required you know uh, ranging from one hourly uh, glucose uh, monitoring to in, in uh, patients who are on iv insulin infusion and in intensive care and then three to four times a day depending on other patients who required oral agents or insulin and maintaining appropriate glycemic control was a very important part of our management and apart from that maintaining adequate hydration and maintaining nutrition getting a dietitian on board if required so which was done in uh, uh, most of our patients so after discharge then again as i mentioned earlier it's very important it's not that you know patient has recovered from covid 19 Maybe patient has slipped and gets stressed or now, or patient had pre-existing diabetes and is switched back to a new regimen or the older regimen, what the case may be, or a patient had uh, you know new onset diabetes. So in each of these cases, a, a definite follow-up or discharge plan is uh, very very important so that you know uh, many times patient has COVID, patient has some issues, you know, a, a, a gluc- fasting glucose of one thirty may take. kind of a back seat but again it's very important for us to communicate that what that fasting glucose of 130 or an hba1c of 6.8 or 6.9 or 6.5 means for the patient you know it's again important because that time patient may not have symptoms that time you know uh, uh, some of us may not pay that much attention in view of the other uh, comorbidities and other issues with the patient but again if glucose levels can rise very fast you know in, in patients with infection in patients with uh, other complications so we need to monitor glucose levels well in such patients so that you know the other treatment whatever the patient is getting you know works well because hyperglycemia can disturb uh, the overall metabolism of the patient patient can get symptomatic reinfection or complications uh, are more common in such cases so that needs a lot of attention for this task uh, patient should be followed up closely at regular intervals in case of stress hyperglycemia pharmacotherapy may not be required for long in most of the cases diet and lifestyle modification is important in all our patients as such but then again uh, glucose monitoring is important you know any once after a period of time is important and follow up is important in such patients patients with newly diagnosed diabetes appropriate titration of the anti hyperglycemic medication and based on the response you can avoid hypoglycemia so conclusion data from the present slides have shown that diabetes one of the most frequent comorbidity in covid 19 patients diabetes promotes severe progression in covid 19 patients and lead to higher icu admission diabetes increases comorbidity and mortality in covid 19 patients again very important and new onset hyperglycemia is with poor outcomes compared to normal glycemia and then again uh, studies are going on but we need more studies to better define interaction between diabetes and covid 19 So these are the final words. So I just explained. I was going to the latest available papers on this topic, and I found this uh, a very interesting statement uh, uh, somewhere in one of the recent meta-analyses that uh, this interaction between COVID-19 and diabetes. So what we are seeing now is a classic example of a lethal intersection between a communicable and a non-communicable disease. So COVID-19, hopefully, you know, I mean, again, uh, we are seeing a few cases, but uh, whatever has happened in the past two years, three years. you know that has not gone we talk about metabolic memory or we talk about glycemic legacy in in diabetes you can see some of the studies so this again you know the many patients thousands of patients you know have been affected uh, with covid 19 so we don't know what effect it has definitely we are seeing in rise uh, in incidence of diabetes and of course not only covid 19 as i mentioned lockdown lack of activity weight gain the kind of food we have been eating you know uh, there have been changes in the past two years and all that i've been seeing a lot of uh, younger patients with diabetes now you know yeah, as young as 16 18 you know school going kids uh, also i've been seeing a lot you know which which is uh, which which is always there but uh, definitely there there is a, an increase in presentation so we don't know what this long covid is going to do so it's always good to create more awareness about diabetes any patients we see it's always good to check glucose levels and uh, follow the current guidelines thank you thank you dr all bakshi it was a wonderful talk and i think uh, it's very very useful because both india and middle east are the uh, world capital of the diabetes 
the maximum number of cases of diabetes are found in these two countries. And the wonderful uh, is an eye opener how the COVID has changed the equation, how the COVID has really opened up a new area of research uh, of uh, stress and diabetes and uh, other things. So it's a wonderful uh, explanation because, uh, as we discussed before, all the three speakers are going to speak on three different aspects of the COVID. Maybe some pertinent question can be asked if there's an audience wants to have something <clears throat> something now. Or we should have, if there's no immediate question in the chat box, then we can go with the second speaker. Let Dr. Shatil take a call on this. Sure, sir. Uh, thank you for a wonderful uh, presentation, Dr. Bakshi. Uh, we have a few questions. Uh, let us uh, address them quickly. Uh, so the first question uh, is, uh, uh, like you said, uh, we are seeing symptoms in uh, children as well. So the first question was whether uh, we'll be uh, seeing this uh, post-stress post hyperglycemia in children as well. So the second part of that question is, uh, can children with diabetes uh, get the vaccine? Yes. So we are seeing uh, uh, yellow patients with diabetes, even children, you know, who had COVID-19. Or, you know, I, I feel, you know, even the lifestyle changes are very really important. You know, I've seen young patients who have COVID-19, but, uh, you know, which, which is unusually uh, at an increased rate. So that, again, as I mentioned a couple of times, lockdown, the way again, lack of activity has a very important role. And the second part of the question is about vaccination. So, yes. Whenever the local guidelines allow, you know, it's different in different countries. So I, I believe the Middle East was started much earlier for younger, younger, younger uh, citizens so and residents. So whenever the guidelines allow, we must go ahead with that. The of diabetes does not, you know, in fact, it becomes even more important in such patients to take the vaccine early so that we can prevent the future infections. Uh, thank you so much for answering that. Uh, now we'll move on to the next question. Uh, is the new onset hyperglycemia due to COVID-19 uh, reversible? Uh, does it subside, which means uh, does it subside over time? Yeah. So there are two aspects to it. So first you have to uh, determine whether it is stress-related hyperglycemia or is new onset hyperglycemia, which is new onset diabetes. So sometimes it can be difficult. You know, and all the patient is okay once we help us with that. So that Admission is you see is around, but again, you know, this has to be taken into account. Agency may be you know, high, and patient may have had pre existing diabetes, which was just not diagnosed earlier because patient didn't check, you know. So that's one thing. And many times, but even so, it may be normal, but patient has tested hyperglycemia, and once patient goes back, and as we said, we follow patients very closely. And after the month, after the month, months, then I'm going to the post level, and I see the agency, it is on the high side. So, you know, it's, it's a bit tricky to, to diagnose it or, you know, comment on that immediately when the patient is there in front of us. So, what is required is regular follow up, monitoring of glucose levels, they must see, and as I mentioned, you know, appropriate diet, exercise, and whatever treatment the patient may require. Uh, thank you for that answer. Uh, one last question uh, from the audience side uh, is it's, it's about. Uh, if uh, steroid induced uh, diabetes, it's about steroid induced diabetes. So, uh, do you see, see similar uh, uh, symptoms like the stress induced uh, diabetes in steroid induced diabetes, uh, which is frequent, which has been frequent during COVID hospitalization? Or do we see any long term effect uh, in these patients who are suffering from steroid induced hyperglycemia? This is into the category which this question uh, mentions. So, steroid is that in someone who was in a different category is normally one C. It is very likely that once steroids are so, you know, the doctor will be probably discussing with that. But I've seen a lot of patients together, very prominent in the hospital. And many patients were given steroids, some for which one duration, you know, some injectable for the rest of the injury, and some of them did require for a slightly prolonged duration. So, one it depends on the dose and duration of steroids, you know. And uh, second is, of course, was the patient pre-diabetic earlier or, uh, you know, is this obese or overweight, that also will play a role. So, but many patients, uh, when the steroids are stopped, the improvement in glucose is seen. So, and many patients with appropriate diet, exercise, and after stopping steroids, we were able to wean them off medications and with follow-up, 
can you not require uh, any medications? And they're not going to be able to do that. But then the process of treatment of patients, especially people who require slightly prone patients to your question, although we're already predisposed to diabetes, although, uh, you know, as I mentioned, a few comorbidities. In such patients, you know, there was unmasking of diabetes, what we call, you know, so with steroids, suddenly the glucose levels went high. And even after stopping steroids, I was not able to stop their medications because the A1C was high and they were requiring medicines for the management of the diabetes. So many of them would not require medicines once for the first time, but the rest of the said, depending on the comorbidities and other factors, may require additional medications because now, you know, the children have must type 2 diabetes. Uh, thank you, Dr. Rahul Bakshi, for that wonderful talk. And uh, yeah, Phil, uh, I, uh, we, we are done with the questions that we had for, from the audience. Uh, we'll, uh, if any more questions are there, uh, we'll, we'll just pass it on to you and uh, you could answer over the chat. Sure. Now we'll move on to the next uh, speaker, Dr. Bansal. Thank you, Dr. Shetil, for this opportunity. At the onset, I'd like to thank, thank the entire team of Doc Plexus and Professor Ashok Gupta, sir, for giving me this opportunity to speak to all of you all on this Sunday evening on COVID-19 and lung diseases. Uh, Dr. Rahul Bakshi gave us an excellent start with a wonderful presentation and the interaction of drugs, COVID-19, and diabetes mellitus. And I will be speaking on COVID-19 and asthma. I'll just be sharing my screen. before I play the video. Dr. Shetil, it's all clear and visible. Can I start? Uh, yes, Dr. Bansal, please go ahead. Okay, thank you. So I'm Dr. Abhay Bansal, consultant, chest physician, and sleep disorder order specialist practicing currently at the Bombay Hospital Medical Research Center at Lanka Clinic, Mumbai, and an honorary chest physician to the Mumbai Police. So sadly, there have been about 500 million or so confirmed cases of COVID-19 as we speak and more than 6 million deaths worldwide since 2019. The true toll is certainly much higher and we've learned that much about the disease from a spectrum of COVID-19 presentations over the last 27 months, ranging from asymptomatic infection to severe pneumonia, respiratory failure and death. There is a growing concern about whether survivors of COVID-19 will have long-term pulmonary sequelae, including fibrotic lung diseases, and or manifestation of progressive lung fibrosis. Now, several chemical features and comorbidities are associated with a pro prognosis and a higher risk of mortality for COVID-19. These include pre-existing health problems such as hypertension, diabetes, cardiovascular disorders, obesity, cancer, CKD, liver disorders, and more importantly, lung disorders with an advancing age, male sex, smoking, alcohol consumption, and race. So whether these risk factors are actual predictors for long-term outcomes of COVID-19, they are currently unknown because we are only two and a half years into the disease and a lot of data still needs to be pooled and percolated and studied whether there is any long-term impact of these underlying comorbidities. Now, early diagnosis of COVID-19 is extremely important, especially in patients of lung diseases, particularly pre-existing asthma, as we know that there are more than 40 million cases of asthma worldwide. Now, due to persistent cough, breathlessness, several patients of asthma may have a concomitant COVID-19 which could be masqueraded as the symptoms and signs of both the diseases are very, very similar. Now, besides the clinical presentation, an acute exacerbation of asthma, which is complicated with a secondary infection, can also mimic the findings which are seen in the COVID-19 pneumonia. So, distinguish between the two becomes very, very difficult and therefore early diagnosis in these patients and prompt treatment becomes extremely essential. Now, some heart-burning questions is what we need to address when we talk of COVID-19 and asthma. Now, are people with asthma at an increased risk of COVID-19 <clears throat> or severe COVID-19? Now, people with asthma do not appear to be at an increased risk. This is a myth. And systematic reviews have shown that there is no risk of severe COVID-19 in patients with well-controlled mild to moderate asthma. Now, well-controlled mild to moderate asthma is patients who are regularly taking their inhalers as prescribed by their physician and are regular with their follow-ups. Now, people with asthma are the increased risk of death in these patients. Now, overall meta-analysis and studies tell that 
all patients of asthma do not have an increased risk of covid-19 provided their asthma is well controlled and there is a study which was published in the jc in 21 which said that asthmatics had a lower risk of death as compared to the general population so there was something in the asthma population which seemed to be protective against death and mortality in covid-19 this is probably the use of inhaled corticosteroids which could be a game changer in managing early covid-19 patients which could reduce the inflammation which was there in the alveolar airways and parenchyma Now, however, the risk of COVID-19 death was increased in people who had received taken oral corticosteroids. Now, as we know that oral corticosteroids given in the first week of illness of COVID-19 increases the viral replication, reduces the host immune response, and triggers a very severe inflammation cascade in the second week. Therefore, we always advise corticosteroids to be given only after seven days of illness, where the viral replication is at the lowest. the inflammation cascade is at its peak where the actual anti inflammatory effect of the oral corticosteroid would take place rather than immunosuppressant effect of the oral corticosteroid now what are the implications and indications for asthma management now it is extremely important of good asthma management and strategies to maintain good asthma control good symptom control to reduce the risk of severe infections and minimize the needs of oral corticosteroids now how do we achieve this Now, my advice to all my asthmatic patients or anyone listening to this webinar is that please be regular with your inhalers. Do not have any myths of being habituated to the inhalers. Do not worry about the side effects of inhalers because they are bare minimum. The dose of inhalers and the steroids in the inhalers is far far lesser, less than twenty to fifty times as compared to an oral tablet, with minimal to negligible systemic absorption. Proper inhaler technique, regular follow up with your physician regarding the use of inhalers. a good asthma control program will prevent a progression of asthma will prevent the need for oral corticosteroid and eventually will prevent the regress need for admission in case there is a covid-19 which is there a superimposed infection in these patients now the third question is that have there been more asthma exacerbations during the covid-19 pandemic no so in 2021 many countries saw a decrease in asthma exacerbations and influenza related illnesses now what is the reason now we all know that any viral illness acts as a trigger for exacerbation of any underlying lung disease be it asthma be it copd be it interstitial lung disease the most common triggers are viral pathogens rather than bacteria so why asthmatics are not having more exacerbations in fact our opd should be flocked with asthma exacerbations so the reasons are precisely not clear but due to public health measures such as hand washing masking social physical distancing has resulted in the reduce of other respiratory infections including influenza so this can be a very very important factor for reduction in asthma exacerbations now we all know that asthma exacerbations are triggered by viral infections bacterial infections adherence to medication environmental pollution and excessive stress now thanks to covid-19 a lot of our patients have been very regular with their inhalers for the fear of getting a disease they've also been wearing masks which prevents community acquired infection such as the flu also masking is helping direct exposure to pollutants staying indoors with physical distancing is also preventing from exposure to infection and pollutants so combined all of these things have resulted in reduced number of exacerbations also being a practicing pulmonologist who deals with a lot of tuberculosis and community acquired pneumonia Surprisingly, over the last two years, we have seen a decline in the number of tuberculosis cases, thanks to people wearing masks in good cough hygiene and etiquette. So, something from the positive side from COVID-19 is educating our population to wearing masks. Maybe we can learn uh, something from the eastern countries where they wear masks routinely in public areas and public transports to prevent the spread of community-acquired infections, mainly the flu, which also. Uh, we saw a spike after the initial SARS pandemic, which hit Southeast Asia. There was a lot of uh, education and awareness of people wearing masks. So that same thing has been inculcated in our Indian population as well. And we see a lot of patients and people, routine people, wearing masks and walking around, which has in fact resulted in the spread of communicable infections and tuberculosis. In fact, now. coming to the burning question of inhaled corticosteroids are they protective in covid-19 now we've seen that a study of hospitalized patients about 50 years with covid-19 corticosteroids inhaled form used in asthmatics were associated with a lower study now this published in lancet was adopted by a lot of countries 
by educating them of with patients having covid-19 telling them that okay in case you've got symptoms of cough you've got breathlessness you've got a wheeze in covid-19 please start using a buresonide inhaler so what buresonide basically is is an inhaled corticosteroid having said that it's not that buresonide is the only inhaled corticosteroid you can use fluticasone bumetazone cyclosemide so any inhaled corticosteroid will result in an anti inflammatory response in the lung thereby it will prevent a progression of a disease this logic is applied to our asthmatics who have fared far better than the general population in covid-19 now when you've got a covid-19 confirmed or a suspected case or local risk is moderate to high we must avoid nebulization when possible to reduce the risk of spreading now we know covid is an airborne disease when we use a nebulizer we are generating particles which are airborne thereby we are increasing the risk of transmission from one person to the other person so if you've got a covid negative patient no problem use a nebulizer but in case of covid 19 positive patient avoid using nebulizers unless you've got a big area you've got proper ventilation good masking techniques and you are at a minimum risk of contacting covid because of the nebulization of the current patient now another important question which i have dealt with in my opd by a lot of patients is that should asthmatics and other lung disease patients take vaccine vs yes. now there are a lot of covid 19 vaccines which have been studied and used worldwide they are absolutely safe and all asthmatic patients in fact everyone we know should take a covid 19 vaccine unless contraindicated now the next question is that is vaccine safe in patients with allergies the reactions known to patients having allergies from vaccines is exceptionally rare now the simple question which i tell my patients is that please count the number of covid 19 infections count the number of deaths because of covid 19 infections you've got your number in 6 million and 500 million the number of patients vaccinated rather than the number of vaccinated doses is in billions and the number of people dying because of covid 19 vaccination would be a handful so you know the risk and benefit of taking a vaccine the final take home message of this talk would be that patients with asthma are not at a higher risk of mortality due to covid 19 the covid 19 diagnosis should be considered in patients of asthma who present with worsening of their respiratory symptoms such as cough breathlessness or wheeze and all asthmatics should receive covid 19 vaccination thank you thank you dr bansal before before we open the session to other panelists and uh, comment i have two questions to ask you uh, we yes, have sir. seen the number of uh, asthma and post covid fibrosis lung fibrosis number of cases have increased and uh, uh, would you recommend a role of uh, what has been at one time a very critical thing of uh, hundreds and thousands of oxygen concentrator were being uh, imported and being uh, shared with common public so what is the role of such a device in the current scenario of uh, uh, post covid fibrosis lung fibrosis and Uh, people those who are required uh, uh, may not be asthmatic but they have a compromised lung function so in those situation what is the role of uh, device like concentrators so excellent question sir firstly we have seen a transient increase in the number of asthmatics post covid so we tend to call this as a post covid sequelae now there are two aspects to this firstly covid 19 virus triggers a post viral bronchial hyperactivity in layman terminology the airways become more hyperactive as a response to the virus so it mimics an asthma now this can be a temporary phenomena or maybe a few month to a few year phenomena which will settle eventually the second is the phenomena of your minimal or mild asthmatic patients who have not been on any treatment get covid the asthma which has been dormant flares up again and as a result of awareness of covid 19 patients are seeking medical help much faster than they normally would so they come to us and as a result of this they have sought medical help and the diagnosis of asthma is made thanks to covid so in these patients oxygen concentrators in asthmatics are generally not required at all maybe one in a million asthmatic patient would require that would be the end stage asthma now coming to post covid fibrosis we have seen that all patients who have recovered from covid have shown a resolution in the post covid fibrosis with time now there have been multiple studies which have shown that use of anti fibrotics versus patients who have not been on anti fibrotics the body has healed on its own a few subset of these patients required oxygen even at the time of discharge and gradually the oxygen requirement had reduced with time at the time when covid 19 was at its peak 
peak i would say with respect to the mortality of the delta variant in 2021 april to june in our country the peak has been different in different parts of the world but we'll talk of our country india between april and june at that point of time there was a strict shortage of beds shortage of oxygen availability and patients were dying for this lack of simple medical care at that point of time importing oxygen concentrators was important and there were people who were holding oxygen concentrators which was not correct and as a result of this there was dearth of oxygen concentrators however today we are well prepared our medical health facilities are better we have experienced from what was there and there is no shortage of oxygen concentrators in our country as of now and i would strongly recommend anybody and everybody to not hold or keep an oxygen concentrator unless advised by their physician if the physician tells you that yes you require oxygen to be used please by all means follow the physician but otherwise don't keep a concentrator at home just for the fear of developing covid 19 i just want to add through my charity organization we have donated five oxygen concentrators to ima juhu oxygen they have a oxygen bank and during the peak hours of peak time of covid and even after that i was getting a report that they were over utilized i mean there was so much of a need for oxygen uh, cylinders and concentrator concentrator proof much better than the oxygen cylinders which had a limited time so this is the time for us to build up a stock of oxygen concentrator give rather than holding it in middle place it is better to Correct. give it to a uh, oxygen tank bank or a organization which can provide these services i think that's a very good thing absolutely sir absolutely and that was a great initiative by you to donate it so that the ima was is a sensible body to use it judiciously that yes. is a very very great initiative and if more people thought like you then we would be in a better position than we were last year no actually i not only sen- cylinders i donated uh, hospital cots and everything mattress etc to hospital which was treating covid so there are a lot of things which can be done on a one to one basis also second thing just a comment just a comment on the mask in view of the new wave which is coming and i have also shared on this platform that a plain cotton mask or a cloth mask has got no value in prevention of this thing it should be double mask preferably a surgical mask or a 95 mask so if we are really going to follow the east pattern of putting a cloth mask i think we should add it should be a proper masking not the just a mask for decoration all these fashion design masks are absolutely nothing but a waste of uh, i agree effort. i agree so sir with respect to the current variant we've had two uh, statements issued by the cdc and the who stating that the first two variants were very deadly the following variants have been more contagious but less less deadly that means more people will get affected but it will be a milder illness and now wearing a mask rather than protecting the other person is protecting yourself much higher in these current variants yes correct so you you should wear a mask for your protection and that is much more protective in the current variant as compared to the previous variants so the previous variants were more deadly thereby you wearing a mask as well as the other pe- uh, person wearing a mask was very very important so when we come uh, in contact with these people who refuse to wear mask so the the guidelines from who and cdc says look if they are not wearing a mask don't force them but you please wear a mask because that will save you 90% of the time from getting covid yeah, in this very, current very, variant the very important wearing the mask is very important for your very own important. protection very important for your own protection and very n95 important. or a surgical mask proper yes. proper double masking or n95 mask yes Thank your you. your face your mouth should be covered completely without exposure to the uh, to the cough field Yeah. yeah thank you thank you very much now open to shitil to share questions from the audience uh thank you so much dr bansal uh, for that wonderful talk uh will uh, almost uh, most of the question you have answered uh there are a few questions which uh, i would be asking <clears throat> so in uh, uh, usually in some some of the children there has been uh, persistent cough and asthma like symptoms uh, post covid <laughs> so uh, uh what is what is the best line of management uh, uh, for such patients okay so in children let let's stratify them into below 6 years 6 years and 11 years and above 11 years now when we come to infants and young children who present with cough and asthma like symptoms post covid we assume that they have a post covid bronchial hyperactivity which needs to be tackled and treated like asthma they require inhalers for how long they require inhalers that depends on the prescribing clinician and the symptomatic control of the patient now like i already said that there may be a dormant asthma 
the patient may be atopic already and not be presenting with any symptoms or mild symptoms which would get all right on their own and the covid-19 has triggered it and catapulted it from a minimal mild to a moderate kind of a picture where the symptoms persist and thereby daily medication is required the other thing is that the airways become much more responsive in a normal situation which is a transient and a temporary phenomena which requires a short term medication the treatment of both the situations would be inhalers inhaled corticosteroids now whether we add a beta agonist or a not beta agonist that depends on the age of the patient so above 6 years we prefer inhaled corticosteroids above 11 years we add an inhaled corticosteroid plus a beta agonist by classifying uh, the steps the step 1 step 2 step 3 step 4 step 5 which is uh, by the gina guidelines for asthma and thereby manage thank you so much for that answer uh, moving on to the next question uh, going to hospital these days uh, being risky due to covid 19 any words of wisdom for asthma patients uh, to keep themselves safe so a word of wisdom to all patients the hospital is the safest place you can be because that is the only place where everyone is wearing a mask so the chance of you getting covid in a hospital is much much lesser than you getting covid outside your house because outside your house you will definitely let your guard down you and me both would have let our guard down look at us we're not wearing a mask right now but inside a hospital everyone is wearing a mask and you receiving important care by your physician for any illness is much more important than you being at risk of covid 19 because we have seen patients coming with advanced diseases severe diseases terminal diseases just because they have been afraid of getting covid they've got covid they've sailed through covid but they've been fated because of the other illness so trust me the hospital is the safest place and please do not delay in visiting your physician for the simple fear of getting covid mask yourself and ensure people around you are masked and maintain appropriate distance and follow protocols I think I I uh, endorse on this. The hospitals are the safest place, but most of the hospitals, which are treating COVID, they have a very tight segregated area for COVID patients and very tight segregated area for non-COVID patients. So all hospitals are obliged by the guidelines, and I'm sure, uh, in case of medical need, you should not hesitate in approaching a proper hospital setup. That's that's a wisest thing I can say. having worked in all type of hospital including government hospital and private setup uh, hospitals are safest place in case of medical need thank you thank you so much uh, dr bansal for your uh, time and effort in making this session very interesting uh, phil uh, move on to the next speaker now uh, dr hanish babu welcome dr hanish thank you you may begin with the presentation now yeah can you see my we can see your uh, screen yeah it's so my my screen on my laptop has disappeared let me see uh we have somebody from the technical team uh, yeah, sir let, yeah, uh, let, let me pause the share and go back sure please open the ppt and then it will yeah. uh, share the yeah. Uh, yeah now it is okay because the yeah now it's okay Coming? No, we are seeing you only. Yeah. Yes, yes, yes. We can we can see the screen now. Yeah. We can see the PPT now. Uh, yes, please okay. go ahead. 
am i audible also yes sir good evening ladies and gentlemen at the outset let me thank uh, doc plexus professor ashok gupta and uh, dr sidil for inviting me for this talk on vitamin d in health and disease during the pandemic vitamin d has once again come to the forefront as studies after studies point towards a major role of vitamin d in immune modulation and prevention of infectious diseases including covid-19 many emerging evidence from ecological and observational studies suggests that vitamin d plays a very important role in health and disease status today we will examine this in detail with special uh, stress on covid-19 vitamin d as we all know is a pro hormone meaning it is in simple words the vitamin its active form acts like a hormone targeting all the cellular functions in our body we will today discuss and summarize the latest findings on the functions of vitamin d at the cellular or molecular level and its role in complex human diseases including covid-19 vitamin d as we all know is a fat soluble vitamin and it's function it functions like a hormone rather than a vitamin as already mentioned there are mainly two forms of vitamin d d2 or ergo calciferol derived mostly from the sun grown mushrooms and d3 or coli calciferol of animal origin vitamin d3 is the active form of vitamin d and of course the best source is from the sunlight the classical function of vitamin d involves as we, as we have all be, always been taught the mineral balance and skeletal maintenance this has been known for a long time when we are all doing or mbbs we are taught uh, about vitamin d and uh, the bone metabolism the non classical function uh, classical functions of vitamin d has come to the forefront during the last 2 to 3 decades or so it involves decoding of genetic information in the dna cells dna of the cells and helping the cells to carry out their specific intended functions vitamin d receptors have been found in all the cells in our body and plays an important role in the causation of cancer lifestyle and autoimmune diseases rickets was long known as being caused by vitamin d deficiency the truth of course is that rickets is just the tip of the iceberg and vitamin d deficiency has far reaching consequences than previously thought of it is becoming increasingly evident that vitamin d has lifelong impact on each of our organs as mentioned earlier vitamin d is also a hormone with both endocrine and autocrine functions in the body it is a hormone because it is synthesized in the body and a vitamin because it is also available from food and supplements now let us examine the production and metabolism of vitamin d in our body in detail 7 dehydrocholesterol which is the derivative of cholesterol in our skin is converted to pre vitamin d3 via the ultraviolet rays ultraviolet b rays from the sunshine this is then thermally converted to vitamin d3 this is very important vitamin d to become active needs the warmth of the sunlight so even if you if a person who is always indoors to receive vitamin d supplements uh, he, uh, the, he may not get the full effect of uh, vitamin d activation in his body both vitamin d3 spontaneously formed in the skin and absorbed from the digestive tract a further hydroxylated to major circulating in storage form that is the 25 hydroxy vitamin d3 in the liver finally this inactive form is hydroxylated to the biologically active form the 125 sorry the 125 uh, hydrox dihydrox vitamin d3 or calcitriol in the kidney calcitriol acts in multiple target organs throughout the body 
by binding to its nuclear receptor, the VDR or the vitamin D receptor, and the vitamin A receptor, that is the RXR, and a number of cofactors to regulate gene expressions from the DNA to produce the specific function of the target cells like differentiation, anti-inflammatory effects, immune regulation, apoptosis, and cell cycle arrest. This is the molecular model of the heterodimer complex of vitamin D receptor VDR. That is, you can see uh, the uh, orange color is the VDR and the RXR is the uh, vitamin A receptor and the DNA. This heterodimer complex ensures the genetic decoding of each cell. So you can imagine how important is vitamin D along with vit vitamin A in our uh, cellular metabolism. Let me simplify it further. <laughs> this is a simplified illustration of how a cell responds to vitamin D and its receptors. Whenever there is a signal or a demand from the body to a particular cell, so for example, let us take uh, the example of beta islet cells of uh, pancreas to, um, to higher blood sugar levels. The calcitriol prompts the VDR, that is the uh, vitamin D receptor, along with the RXR, to decode the instruction in the DNA of the islet cells to transcript the production of insulin. In short, calcitriol or vitamin D Activated vitamin D3 is the key that unlocks the DNA library in our cells. This happens in all the cells, including the macrophages, the muscles, the nerve cells, every cell. So, uh, the uh, when the demand is met, it again locks the DNA cell library. If the level of vitamin D is adequate, the cells will respond in proper dose-dependent manner to a stimulus or demand. That is well understood. But when there is a deficiency, as happens quite often, the response may not be sufficient to meet the demand or the stimuli. It simply means that in vitamin D deficiency states, the normal functioning of our cells, tissues, and organs will become sluggish, and prolonged deficiency will lead to disease states involving complex hormonal, metabolic, autoimmune, allergic, and infective repercussions in our body. This is very, very important because most of us, when I, when, when I started taking interest in vitamin D during the early stages of the COVID-19, why I took, started taking interest is an um, interesting thing. I started thinking why, as many of us have thought, why are almost 80 to 85% of people not getting severe disease, while 10 to 15 percent people go to severe illness. Why is it so? What is the difference? What is, what is there in our body which um, uh, stops the disease uh, at the point of entry or from getting into a severe state? Of course, our immune system, this we all know. But what is that? It, what is that which forms the immune system? This is where the uh, study and search went to vitamin D and the other nutrients. And of course, vitamin D is the most important thing, you know. We all know that it is equivalent to the photosynthesis in plants, vitamin D synthesis in the human beings. We can even say, go to the extent of saying that the production of vitamin D in our skin is the, from the sun rays is the basis of life on earth. And it simply means that, um, uh, as we have seen, when the Vitamin D is deficient, our body does not respond well, it becomes sluggish. So in short, our genes do not want to be making proteins continuously. They need to be turned on and off. And vitamin D is the main, uh, main major regulator of gene expression in our, in our cells. I'll go a little faster because there are so many slides. It is important to remember that vitamin D is not a standalone nutrient. When we talk about vitamin D, people uh, will start thinking, why is, is this the only important thing in, in our body? No, it cannot act alone. That is uh, definite and it has been proven. It acts synergistically with other vitamins like vitamin A, vitamin K2, vitamin C, and vitamin E, along with minerals like magnesium. Magnesium is very important because each step of vitamin D activation, uh, magnesium is required. 
and zinc and other nutrients of course this is why whenever we find patients with vitamin d deficiency don't just um, uh, give them supplements of vitamin d alone you always uh, take a detailed history to see that they are taking a balanced diet if not advise them to take a balanced diet or take an um, supplement multivitamin multimineral supplement along with vitamin d then only vitamin d will be effective hence uh, it is very important that we uh, a well balanced diet is also important along with the proper sun exposure for this vitamin d endocrine system to function well vitamin d has got lots of modulatory effects on all cells of the innate and adaptive immune system uh, i'm not going into details of each of the uh, of the activity of vitamin d and vitamin d receptor in the uh, cells of the innate and um, the adaptive immune system uh, we all know these uh, effects are th- the important cause for vitamin d to uh, have a very telling effect on our immune system and of course uh, in infective infectious diseases like uh, covid-19 <coughs> this is an illustration of how the innate immune system is activated through the vitamin d signaling pathway when a pathogen invades a macrophage this is the macrophage you can see the uh, when a, when the pathogen invades the macrophage the toll like receptor signaling is activated on the cell surface resulting in an increased expression of vdr increase the expression of vdr and the cytokine p27 b1 enzyme this in turn induces the binding of active vitamin d to the vdr which then binds to the vitamin d responsive element in the nucleus resulting in the production of cimp or the uh, antimicrobial proteins the catelicidin and defensin in covid-19 this first happens in the portal of entry the nasal and oropharyngeal mucosa if the innate immune system and the vitamin d levels are uh, up at, at the optimum level and working well and the viral load is limited the virus is eliminated at this point that is why in patients with loss of smell and taste the disease severity is much less as has been observed in many many studies than those who do not have had these uh, symptoms so the uh, first at the portal of entry when the innate system get activated vitamin d and vitamin d receptor along with the rxr that is the vitamin a receptor activates the uh, the um, production of cimp the catelicidin and defensin which uh, results in viral and other bacterial and other microbial uh, killing vitamin d as we have also as i have also mentioned um, regulates the production of antibodies and plays an important role in calming the cytokine storm and exaggerated inflammatory responses in uh, acute respiratory distress syndrome in covid-19 when we understand the effects of vitamin d and its receptors in each and every cell of the body it becomes easier to realize how vitamin d suppresses aging signals in our body there are lots of metabolic pathways involved and for of for want of time i will not go into details of calcipotriol exhibits um, both photoprotective properties against uv rays induced skin damage and photo aging through dna pro- uh, protection and repair through its antioxidant and anti inflammatory effects now we will just uh, go to the second part that is uh, after having seen the examine the metabolism and cellular actions of vitamin d we will quickly take a look at the role played by vitamin d in common diseases vitamin d has been linked to a large number of human diseases this is not surprising as um, more than 3 as we have already seen more than 3% of human genome is regulated by the vitamin d endocrine system more than 100 years since the outbreak of the 1918 influenza pandemic the spanish flu we have faced this uh, pandemic of equal gravity if not uh, greater many studies have reported that people who died of covid-19 tended to have low levels of vitamin d of course majority of those people had other comorbidities as well it is evident that age obesity and other comorbidities not just vitamin d levels may have made people more vulnerable to poor health outcomes after being infected with uh, covid-19 there are many 
studies, uh, dozens and dozens of studies undertaken during the COVID-19 pandemic, which suggests that vitamin D deficient status was associated with increased COVID-19 risk. Furthermore, many data has shown, many studies and uh, the data therein have shown that how the vitamin D level is markedly low in COVID-19 patients with serious illness. Earlier research, even earlier than uh, COVID, that is, this study was done in uh, 2015. Uh, it has shown that how vitamin D has a protective effect against respiratory tract infections. This was corroborated by Rachel et al. in a landmark study. Uh, this study in 2015, who found that vitamin D deficiency is common in people who develop ARDS. Uh, they recommended that vitamin D deficiency should be corrected in patients with respiratory infections to reduce the risk of developing ARDS. In 2017, a much larger study in BMJ analyzed 25 eligible RCTs with a total of 11,321 participants aged 0 to 95. They concluded that vitamin D supplementation was safe and it protected against acute respiratory infections. Nearer in May 2020, in a study in European Journal of Clinical Nutrition, Mariami Badi et al. noted that patients with mild to moderate vitamin D deficiency are high risk groups to get severe COVID-19 illness. Given the high prevalence of vitamin D deficiency and in other in order to rapidly, safely, and significantly raise serum concentrations, they recommended high dose vitamin D intervention with potential benefit in decreasing risk of COVID 19 severity and mortality. Uh, this is the latest research came uh, a few months uh, before from Trinity College and University of Edinburgh, which found that ambient ultraviolet B radiation, which is the key for vitamin D production in the skin at an individual's place of resid residence in the weeks before COVID-19 infection was strongly protective against severe disease and death from COVID-19. There are many, many uh, studies, population studies, retrospective studies, observational studies, meta-analysis, ongoing clinical trials, reviews, etc. I'm not going into details. It is all available in the, uh, in the literature and uh, on the web from Philippines, from UK. Uh, this was an observational study from 20 European countries in May 2020, which suggested that vitamin D supplementation protected against um, uh, severe uh, COVID-19. We can uh, clearly see that vitamin D levels improved the infectivity and mortality significantly. In another observational study, researchers analyzed patients' data from 10 countries. They noted that patients with severe vitamin D deficiency are twice as likely to experience major complications after COVID-19 infection. There are so many studies, but uh, still, uh, unfortunately, we find that uh, the governmental uh, agencies, the health agencies, even doctors uh, concentrating more on vitamin C and zinc than vitamin D. The vitamin C and zinc, of course, is important, very important, of course, in, uh, in controlling the infection. But vitamin D is much, much important because it, is, it uh, really triggers the immune system and regulates the immune system. So we have to see, uh, actually, it should be made imperative that each and every patient uh, should be uh, examined for vit their vitamin D levels and it should be corrected. Even if vitamin D does not have a uh, positive effect on the outcome of the disease, it is always better to correct deficiencies. We will never go wrong there. There are more reviews. I uh, will just go through it faster. The many studies showing that circumstantial evidence is very strong and cannot be ignored. This is a very interesting study which predicted vitamin D values in association with C-reactive protein which is a surrogate marker for overreactive, overreactive immune response or cytokine storm in COVID-19 patients. The outcome of all these studies is very simple. It is safer to correct deficiency of vitamin D to reduce the risk of infection, to reduce the severity of the infection, and to restrict the complications of COVID-19. We will discuss about the dosage scheduled soon. Uh, a few studies have pointed towards use of high-dose oral 
vitamin D and antioxidants to reduce the risk and severity of coronavirus infection um, proposed by many researchers. The aim was to keep the serum 25 HD levels higher than 40. This is a recent study that found greater proportion of vitamin D deficient individuals with SARS-CoV-2 infection turned SARS-CoV-2 RNA negative with a significant decrease in fibrinogen on high dose cholecalciferol supplementation with levels of 60,000 international units daily for seven days. In general, to cause adverse effects, uh, we are, naturally we tend to think will such high doses cause uh, vitamin D toxicity. Many studies are pointed towards that uh, to cause adverse effects of high toxicity from orally administered vitamin D, one needs to take daily doses higher than 25,000 international units for many months, not days, or take 1 million international unit daily for a few days. So this very high dose, usually not done accidentally. A few cases have happened, but usually it does not. A word of caution, of course, is uh, if we are going uh, for higher doses, always be on the lookout of hypervitaminosis D, resulting in hypercalcemia and renal damage. There are, these are the clinical trials, many of which have uh, concluded and some are, some are still going on. And there are many, which uh, very few out of many, maybe even uh, um, dozen or so positive studies come, one or two negative studies are also coming. This is natural. Uh, we will discuss about it. This is why. Though we have to remember the dictum that when studies find an association between two things, it does not mean one thing caused the other to happen. This, this is what uh, actually confuses uh, our researchers about vitamin D. Actually, there is no need to, <laughs> there is no need to study whether vitamin D affects the course of an in infection. It is natural that it will definitely affect. Then why in some cases uh, we do not find this, uh, the uh, real association? This is because one, two things. One is any disease, whether it is COVID, diabetes, or any even if it is infectious, non-infectious, it is lifestyle disease or other, uh, other diseases caused by germs, any diseases have got more than one factors uh, in, in its uh, causation. So when we el eliminate one cause and only study one cause without considering the other causes, the result will not be correct. We have to study vitamin D, the association of vitamin D with uh, COVID-19. We should study, in if we are studying in 10 people who have got the, uh, who have got the same genetic makeup, who have been brought up uh, uh, similarly, whose other parameters, health parameters are similar, then only we can compare, we can say that uh, uh, the association is uh, correct or wrong. So this is where we, we, go, we tend to go wrong. As uh, we have seen, there are many problems in establishing causality of a specific illness. These are the, some of the few studies that pointing out there is no clinical evidence that vitamin D supplements are beneficial in treating COVID-19. This is a nice study which reviewed five studies and came to a negative conclusion regarding the association of vitamin D and COVID-19. Another um, negative cross-sectional study. Naturally, a question arises, are these studies flawed? Is um, uh, evidence-based medicine sometimes misleading us? When the question is, when a uh, vitamin or a hormone like vitamin D, which is essential for our uh, DNA or genes to transcript proteins for its uh, for the expression of its uh, function, if it is less, it is evident. It is common sense that the cells will not work well. So why why do we why do we want to dig deeper uh, into the association of uh, vitamin D or any other nutritional factor with the uh, production of uh, uh, in infections like uh, our COVID-19? This is a question that we should ask, ask ourselves. This is the confusion out there in the uh, both in the media as well as in the uh, in our um, medical uh, field. Conflicting reports. This could be, as we have discussed, this could be because of the factors which decide the course and outcome of any disease. 
including COVID-19, is multifaceted. We have already discussed that. I'm not going into detail. Let me uh, tell a simple example. It's uh, something that even laymen can understand. If a um, uh, machine working on electricity is working on low voltage, the voltage supply is low, and the machine breaks down or uh, it uh, catches fire because of the friction and grinding due to low voltage. If you give more voltage, the normal voltage to that same machine, will it work? Definitely no. It is already damaged. So how can you say once the disease has happened because of low vitamin D and other nutritional diseases, if you give vitamin D, how can you uh, correct the disease activity? No, it's difficult unless it is rickets, of course. In rickets, it is vitamin D causing the um, problems. The real deficiency disease can be corrected. Other diseases which are caused due to the inflammatory action, due to the immunomodulatory action, because of the um, other allergic reactions, autoimmune diseases, if we give vitamin D, or uh, other uh, nutrients and uh, the patient leads a healthy lifestyle. It does not mean that the disease will be cured, but maybe we will be able to arrest the progress. So this is it. This is where the conflict comes with the uh, positive and negative studies. Now let us to, uh, look at a um, uh, brief look at the role of vitamin D in other body systems. I will not go into detail here, just uh, flip through because to cover uh, we are not just about um, uh, vitamin D and COVID-19, other systems also, because there are lots, lots of studies uh, with uh, about vitamin D and our uh, various systems. There have been extensive studies regarding vitamin D and cardiovascular system, as is seen in this slide. Uh, these studies have found that vitamin D is indeed important in regulating blood pressure and other cardiac and vascular functions. Vitamin D has been linked with uh, many cancers, gastrointestinal cancers, prostate and breast cancers, lymphomas, endometrial and lung cancers, uh, which highlights the fact that vitamin D supplements could reduce cancer incidence and death rates because it can further, as we have already discussed, it can stop further progression or even prevent cancers if we keep the vitamin D at an optimum level. Vitamin D has a protective role to play in many cancers, including breast and cervical cancer in women, pancreatic cancer. Vitamin D intake and sun exposure have been found to be beneficial in reducing the incidence of Alzheimer's. Mother's exposure to UV rays and use of vitamin D predicted vitamin D and childhood bone mass in 198 children who have been followed for nine years. The nurse cell study is a very huge study involving more than 80,000 women found low serum levels of uh, vitamin D was associated with impaired pancreatic beta cell function and insulin resistance. Uh, there are so many uh, studies, I'll just uh, skip through this. Because vitamin D uh, status is highly associated with the risk of autoimmunity. Vitamin D has been implicated in prevention and protection of autoimmune disease also. The VDR resistance, uh, resistance to vitamin D was found in multiple sclerosis. In skin diseases, skin uh, not only being important for the synthesis of vitamin D, uh, many of the skin diseases, especially the autoimmune diseases like uh, psoriasis, you all know that the first uh, topical treatment, the most, most effective topical treatment for uh, Vitamin D uh, for uh, so this was uh, the from the vitamin D it was vitamin D derivative calciputriol. So, so many uh, it plays a vital role in regulation of almost all skin functions. Uh, well established role has been found in the etiopathogens of psoriasis and uh, in the treatment of psoriasis, lichen sclerosis, atopic morphia and inconclusive evidence in the allergic and other autoimmune diseases. Uh, patients on prolonged systemic steroid therapy will definitely benefit from concurrent vitamin D supplementation. Before we conclude, a few words about the vitamin D dosage schedule. As we all know, blood tests are the only way to know whether we are uh, vitamin D deficient or not. 
vitamin D3 total actually vitamin D3 25 oil total should be tested. This is the normal and abnormal values. Severely deficient less than 10 nanogram per ml. Deficiency uh, between less than uh, that is less than 20 nanogram per ml. Insufficient between 20 to 30 that is less than 30. And sufficient levels above 30 that is uh, between 30 to almost uh, 60. And uh, optimum levels now has changed from 30 to 40. Between 40 to 60 is the optimum level. The 30 nanogram per ml level was uh, fixed long back when uh, we were only knowing about the role of vitamin D in bone and mineral metabolism. Now it is not so. Vitamin D is required for each and every cellular function. So we need a higher level of vitamin D uh, above 50 to 60. That is the optimal level that we should aim for in patients. In the vitamin D deficient patients, the dosage should be no, dosage should be 50,000 international units per week for 8 to 12 weeks. After that, once every two weeks for another 12 to 16 weeks. Or 10,000 international units, five days a week for eight to 12 weeks, and then an alternate day on alternate days, 10,000 international units for 12 to 16 weeks. Once the normal level, that is 40 to 50 or up to 60 is reached, then the maintenance should be done with 50,000 monthly or 1,000 to 4,000 of vitamin D3 daily, depending upon sun exposure and uh, the supplements. Up to 6,000 is safe. Higher doses of injection is only required if there is severe deficiency, that is, when it is below 5 nanogram per ml. Vitamin D deficiency is a global problem. Because of the modern way of living and um, commuting, of course, we get down from our home into the car, then get down from the car into our office and back. So there is no sun exposure. Contrary to popular belief, vitamin D deficiency is rampant in our sunny country, with prevalence of deficiency ranging from 40 to 99% in some places. Very, very surprising. And worse, a study among healthcare professionals in India showed only 6% had above normal levels of vitamin D. Only 6%. That was a long time back. Now uh, it has changed. After COVID, uh, everything has changed. When uh, COVID started, many of our patients who came, almost 90% uh, were deficient. Now most of them have achieved, uh, majority of them have achieved the normal because of the uh, education that has been going on during the COVID. Vitamin D intoxication occurs when blood levels rise above 150 nanogram per ml, that is 375 nanomole per ml. But it is very extremely rare, as we have already seen. But if you are giving uh, the signs of vitamin D toxicity, uh, of course, elevated blood calcium levels, nausea, vomiting, poor appetite, stomach pain, constipation, and diarrhea. The most important, in addition to the kidney failure, is bone loss because it interferes with vitamin K2 and calcium. There is high bone loss in when the vitamin D toxicity is there. So to avoid toxicity, if you are giving high dose vitamin D, uh, always monitor the uh, prothrombin hormone. It should be below its lowest uh, limit. Ionized calcium levels should be uh, tested and the balancing should be done with proper um, supplementation with magnesium and vitamin K2 and proper uh, good hydration and limiting dietary calcium intake. When you are giving, when we are giving patients high dose of vitamin D or they are on the higher level of vitamin D supplementation, better not give a calcium supplement along with it unless it is a patient of osteoporosis or a patient above the age of 60, especially women who requires calcium. Otherwise, normal healthy people should not be given calcium along with uh, high dose of vitamin D because it will lead to hypercalcemia. Worrying about uh, this, I, I found very, uh, very striking slide. That's why I put it here. Worrying about vitamin D toxicity is like worrying about drowning when you are dying of thirst. We have to correct the deficiencies without worrying about the uh, vitamin D toxicity now. But there is a, uh, there is a caution also. Some studies have found that in addition to the very low levels of vitamin D, 
even high levels of vitamin D that is above 60, going especially beyond 100. The, uh, they indicated a U-shaped response curve for lifespan. Both animal and human studies have indicated this U-shaped response curve for lifespan with premature aging associated with both too little and too much vitamin D. So uh, both are uh, wrong and both are uh, to be avoided. This is, these are the, finally, these are the optimum levels of vitamin D, 40 nanogram per ml to 50 nanogram per ml or 90 nanomole per liter to 125 nanomole per liter. So as we all know, 80% of patients uh, we get uh, from sunlight. Uh, foods and supplements that are high in vitamin D include cod liver oil, fatty fish, egg yolks, and mushrooms. These are the, uh, some of the food items and the supplements that have got uh, uh, vitamin D. Vegetarians are usually vitamin D deficient unless they take fortified foods, supplements, or get sufficient sun exposure. They are also prone for vitamin B12 and protein deficiencies, of course, that we all know. On the other hand, non-vegetarians are spoiled for choices regarding the vitamin D sources. But it is a, it is a um, uh, paradoxical thing that many of the uh, non-vegetarian countries, uh, the population is very low on uh, vitamin D because they are exposed to sunlight very rarely. There are a few medical conditions where sun exposure we all know, but vitamin D supplementation may have adverse effects. This we have to keep in mind. Sarcoidosis, be careful while giving vitamin D supplementation. History of renal calculi, always be careful of hypercalcemia. Uncontrolled endocrine diseases, hepatic or renal disease. We have seen the uh, conversion of vitamin D, the metabolism of vitamin D needs healthy liver and healthy kidney. If there is uh, hepatic or renal disease, the dosage has to be reduced in uh, vitamin D deficient status. Photosensitive diseases such as SLE with cutaneous manifestations also, uh, we have to be very careful while giving high dose vitamin D. It should be avoided. So the question, final question is, should vitamin D be scripted in each and every prescription that we give to the patient? What should be, what should be our approach? Being, uh, it is of course uh, evident that being an essential nutrient, it should always be tested in all chronic dermatology. Uh, I, this is uh, <laughs> for my dermatology uh, talk for all patients and corrected whenever necessary. Whenever necessary, because um, there is no uh, nothing to lose by testing. I have heard many doctors telling, "What is the use of testing when everybody is deficient?" There is a use. Why? Because if the dose is very low, then we have to give high dose. If the dose is normal, then we can give a normal maintenance dose. In addition to that, there is another, another important thing that I have noticed. Checking the vitamin D and showing the patient these are your levels, you have to keep it above, has got a very, very big uh, role to play in uh, whether the patient will follow your orders or not. Uh, the patient will definitely follow when he sees the uh, results and then uh, try to make it uh, regular regular, and uh, go on uh, taking the normal maintenance dose. Another um, problem that I have seen, even um, some patients have come and uh, told that I had uh, vitamin D levels less than 10, it was near 5 or 6, and doctor gave me and told to take for 3 months. Then, then what happened? After three months, they stopped. And again, uh, the uh, same thing happens. Unless they, have, they change their um, uh, lifestyle and go for sun exposure and a balanced diet, they will again go uh, to the hypovitaminosis uh, D status. So never tell the patients to stop. Tell them this is like food. There is no course for vitamins and nutrients. This, this, uh, this is the exact sentence that I tell the patients. There is no course. The course is only for uh, antibiotics and other uh, medications for illnesses. For vitamins and nutrition, there is no course. It is like your food. If you take food today and is satisfied, tomorrow definitely you will again take food. Same thing with this. You have to keep a, maintain a normal level to stop uh, diseases from occurring. So these are the summary and take home messages. The current uh, recommendations uh, are, 
suggest that levels of 40 nanogram to 50 to 60 nanogram may be considered safe for all individuals. The current recommendation suggests consuming 1,000 to 4,000 international units of vitamin D per day. This may be raised to 5,000 to 6,000 in the deficient. Vitamin D3 is preferred over vitamin D2. Best time of sun exposure. This is another confusion. Many uh, patients uh, think that the best time is early morning and e evening. No. Early morning and evening sunlight is good. There are other, other uh, benefits of sunlight exposure. But for us, because we know that vitamin D is produced by UVB, the uh, best time for sun exposure is between 10 a.m. to 3 p.m. So if we, are, if we are leading a healthy lifestyle with balanced nutritional diet, optimum sun exposure and regular exercise, proper hydration, rest and relaxed lifestyle, then we do not require supplements. If we are not taking supplements, do regular checkups to rule out nutritional deficiencies, including that of vitamin D. So final point is, to sum up, the take-home message is vitamin D is not an optional supplement anymore. It is a non-negotiable cellular necessity. It is an important part of our uh, life support system and keep it at an optimal level. For more information, I have got around eight hours worth of um, uh, talks on vitamin D on YouTube and my FB pages uh, for details of each because uh, there are so many things uh, that we are not covered because, uh, because of uh, lack of time. Uh, th uh, there are lots of things about vitamin D. So please uh, go through this. These are the other references. This is one uh, slide that I made for my Meet the Pandemic uh, talk where uh, the healthy lifestyle along with the uh, sunshine, sun exposure and the SMS and of course the vaccine uh, hits at the COVID-19. This is the message that we have to give, the, give to the uh, public of course. Healthy lifestyle leading the leading the line of protection against um, COVID-19. Thank you. Thanks a lot. Uh, uh, sorry, I have short uh, beyond my time. Hope it has been useful. No. Thank you very much, Dr. Uh, Hanish Babu. Excellent talk. I mean, how much role is being played by vitamin D? Uh, extremely, extremely well heard, uh, described to everyone. And I just wonder, as you mentioned, in all the uh, domicile care and the patient do, do not require hospitalization for COVID, they are just given the vitamin C supplement and sent home. And I think what you have mentioned, vitamin D also should be a mandatory part of that yes. supplement in all the COVID or non-COVID patient also, those are taking home supplement. I think this is a wonderful presentation you have made. And uh, of course, I'm not a physician, but other uh, Dr. Bakshi and Dr. Bansal may add to their comment in respect to specialty, the role being played by vitamin D. Some second question, which I wanted, you very nicely presented, that the heat element is also important. Yes, yes. As we know, the uh, UVA and UVB rays are filtered, not filtered by cloth, not filtered by the sunscreen, etc., or with a glass. Even when you are sitting in your car and going in that period, UVB can still be on the uh, window side if you are sitting there. You can still get the benefit. You don't have to. Uh, so, this is a very important point to uh, measure the time also. And I think very, very valuable hint. Over to Dr. Bansal and Dr. Shatil. Yes, thank you. Uh, Dr. Bansal, do you have any questions? Uh, sir, you are on mute. Dr. Bansal. I think it was an excellent presentation by Babu, sir. He has covered all aspects of vitamin D thoroughly. And definitely there is a role of vitamin D supplementation in all illnesses. We have known that any micronutrient and vitamin deficiency delays the recovery of a patient. So thereby having optimal levels of every micronutrient and vitamin in the body will only speed up the recovery of the patient. So if we assume by default that there are vitamin D deficiencies in 70 to 80% of our general population, there is no harm in supplementing the nutrients. It will only add benefit to the patient rather than having an adverse effect. That has been beautifully summed up by Babu sir, and I completely agree with him. Thank you. Dr. Bakshi, Dr. Bakshi has to add something. Is it? Uh, yes, sir. No, this was a very comprehensive uh, session by Babu sir. You know, I'm vitamin D in great depth. 
and uh, he's covered i think everything you know including diabetes so i have nothing more to add yes yeah. thank you very much thank you thank you now shetil over to shetil for yeah. the question answer and including remarks sure sir uh, thank you uh, thank you dr anish uh, for that wonderful presentation uh, so moving on to to the question so a study published uh, states that uh, on the on the 50 hospitalized people with covid 19 uh, who were given a high dose of uh, uh, type of vitamin d only one needed treatment in the intensive care unit uh what is your take on giving high dose of uh, vitamin d for hospitalized covid 19 patients uh, this we have already uh, discussed in one or two slides but um, uh it can be done if if the patient is very uh, the level is very low the studies not one study there are more than uh, half a dozen studies with uh, high dose vitamin d only thing is we have to monitor the Uh, elemental ca the calcium calcium levels and uh, the pth levels uh, we have to um, we have to closely monitor uh, to see that uh, patient does not go into the hypervitaminosis uh, d status that's all, that's it but uh, many studies have pointed towards it but what i feel is some studies have seen we are not uh, shown those slides some studies have shown that in place of uh, high dose vitamin d giving patients daily doses or frequent doses gives provides better protection against diseases so uh, so for us when we are uh, advising for, to patients to take 50000 weekly or 60000 weekly instead of that uh, telling them to to take 10000 daily for 5 days a week give 2 days uh, rest and then take uh, for deficient people for those who are not deficient instead of giving 60000 per month as a maintenance dose let them take uh, 1000 to 2000 international units per day that will be better but usually what we have seen is uh, the patients uh, usually uh, skip on the dosage schedule and they don't actually maintain it that's the main problem they, and they also want the uh, convenience of taking single uh, tablet so uh, this is uh, good good studies are that we need further studies to see uh, especially not only in covid in many infectious diseases whether uh, for admitted patients uh, we should give uh, if they are deficient we should give the high dose uh, vitamin d just a question dr anish babu as you said bolus dose uh, what is a, a daily dose yes. which is better i mean in case of not very severe it, deficiency if it is uh, highly high high deficient state it is uh, imperative that we bring them to a normal level fast so we we, we can give them bolus dose to start with once they have attained the uh, normal levels then we can go for maintenance daily doses that will be better thank you thank you uh, thank you so much uh, dr anish for the for that answer uh, we'll move on to the next question now <laughs> Uh, with the pandemic and lockdown the exposure to sunlight has reduced significantly uh, are we seeing some interesting changes with work from home situation currently yes definitely uh, in the beginning of uh, pandemic and during pandemic also many people have become deficient in vitamin d vitamin d deficiency lack of exercise this uh, combination uh, obesity this all works out the uh, of course the uh, lifestyle diseases are going uh, have gone up gone up very much and depression uh, th there are studies showing that the depression caused by lack of sun exposure especially in the western temperate climates is uh, could be due to Uh, continuous vitamin d deficiency causing neuronal uh, sluggishness in the brain so uh, these are the things that we have to uh, what i tell my patients is even if there is um, uh, covid especially only in the covid earlier states some governments are told don't go out don't uh, step outside but once the it is relaxed it only means you should not go to crowded areas what is wrong in going to your balcony what is wrong in go, go, going to uh, the fields or the parks where there is not much crowd or the beach uh, where are the beach is there you can go and get exposed to sunlight but in summer times especially in north india and even in gulf now it's very hot 
uh, near 50 uh, we cannot address people to exposed to sunlight between uh, 10 to 3 so we tell them start vitamin d uh, now have some sun exposure in the early morning and night to get that warmth because warmth of sunlight is very important to activate vitamin d without warmth if you take vitamin d and sit inside vitamin d is not going to work well so we always tell the patient uh, have a little sun exposure whether it is in the morning or evening no problem but once the summer is over in the winter uh, uh, months always uh, try to get at least 3 days in a week half an hour sun exposure between 10 to 3 to actually it should be uh, at least 40% of your body surface area that is not possible for most people at least your hands and feet and uh, of course um, uh, face most people don't want you can use uh, sunblock there that is not going to affect much uh, in your vitamin d production if you are exposing to the hands and feet uh, thank you so much for that elaborate answer. So with this, uh, we'll conclude this session. Just uh, one comment I want to add for Harish. Sure, 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 Dr. Gupta. Both he being dermatologist and I being plastic surgeon, the current lifestyle is UV blocks. 90% of the ninety percent of the ladies and more than 50% of the people are crazy about 50% UV block to 70% UV block. And the other and, end, they cover yeah are they doing good for themselves or they are doing harm to their body with uv blocks uh, we have to balance between the fear for uh, skin cancer and uh, vitamin d production see if uh, a very fair lady especially caucasians we can uh, imagine them uh, having fear about uh, skin cancer but for people from Indian continent, from African continent, from the Middle East, who are uh, brown, brownish to um, dark skinned, there is no need to worry about uh, skin cancer. Or uh, that is another thing. And pigmentation, getting becoming uh, uh, tanned is a big problem for um, fair ladies, of course, especially in the uh, the uh, female gender. For them, the advice is, if you don't want to tan yourself, use always use uh, so this um, sun screens, SPF 50 or even above. Because um, SPF 30, usually we say a few words about uh, sunscreen. Uh, usually in uh, Western textbooks, they told SPF 30 is sufficient. That is sufficient for people from temperate climates. For us in India and in Middle East where uh, in the summer it is very hot when you go out, those people who are at the, who are going to stay for a longer time, they can always put SPF up to SPF 100. That is not going to uh, interfere too much with the vitamin D uh, production. You have some sun exposure on your thing. And you don't have to stay in the direct sunlight to get um, UVB rays. You can get UVB rays if you stand in the sh shades also, if you stay in the uh, balcony also. So this we have to tell the patient. Don't worry about, only use uh, sunscreen in the on the face. Other areas don't use sunscreen unless you are going to have a prolonged bath in the sea or in the swimming pool. Don't use uh, sunscreen in other areas. Even then, sunscreens will not uh, stop 100% UVB rays from going in, inside. Maybe 50 to 60 percent can be uh, stopped. Uh, if you if you put 100 percent can be stopped. If you put like our cricketers, like the cement uh, uh, or <laughs> white, white, white paint yeah. type of. Uh, white paint, yeah. Like most of the cricketers are using it during. Yeah, yeah. But I think I have yeah. also seen uh, whatever available. 30 percent is no use for the type three and type four skin. What we have, it is only the 50 percent and above which we are using. But it's a very very important part, particularly postmenopausal women with a vitamin D deficiency, they, they are blocking a very vital source of vitamin D by putting a sunblock, which has to be understood by all of them. Thank you. Yes, Shatil, yes, please. Yes, uh, thank you for that elaborate answer. Uh, so let's wrap up this session. Uh, and lastly, uh, I would just like to uh, if, if, if you can share a takeaway message for the audience here, uh, each of few speakers, a few words of wisdom from all yeah. of them. 
I think I will start with Dr. Bakshi, then I will conclude. Is Rahul still there? Or with uh, Dr. Bansal to begin with? So I think the take home message would be to, for lung issues and COVID-19 would be to seek early care and to be regular with your medication, follow up regularly with your physician and vaccinate yourself. Take all vaccines necessary, right from COVID-19 to influenza to pneumococcal and wear a mask. That's it. Over to you, sir. Yeah, I mean, the last is I would appreciate wear a mask. Wear a mask appropriately and proper mask. I think I would say that that should be the take home message. Wearing a mask will definitely help you in, uh, and like I said, vitamin D. Wearing a mask can have uh, exposure to sunlight. They are two very vital points. Yes. <clears throat> if Dr. Bakshi is not there, then Dr. Hanish Babu. Yeah, that's what we have been talking. Um, if if you are not examining uh, <coughs> your vitamin D so far, at least do once. If you find it too costly, at least start. If you are not taken vitamin D properly uh, till now, supplement uh, till now, or is not exposing to sunlight between 10 to 3, then start a normal dosage of 1,000 to 2,000 per day adults and kids 400 to 1,000. Uh, this should be taken continuously, prolonged, uh, until you have a proper sun exposure. One. Second, along with uh, vitamin D, it is also important to have a little sun exposure and also have a balanced diet. As we have seen, vitamin D cannot work alone. It needs vitamin C, vitamin A, vitamin K2, magnesium, zinc, all these things are necessary. So, so just if you are vitamin D deficient, if you take only vitamin D, iron, Iron also, uh, anemia, we know it also causes uh, lots of problems. So these things, a balanced diet, a regular exercise, rest, stress management, along with that, a little sun exposure, and if deficient, sufficient uh, supplementation will help you fight off, uh, will help you, uh, will give you the inbuilt uh, resistance to any infection, not only this pandemic, any in, uh, oncoming or uh, future pandemic also, we will be ready to face them. Along with that, as uh, doctors, uh, uh, what they have told, uh, the proper masking. And uh, when you are in a very crowded place, keep a little space between the people. And also those who have not taken vaccine, take the vaccine. Thank you. I think to conclude, this is a wonderful uh, discussion, wonderful session. And as we have been telling in the past also, this is not the last uh, pandemic. We should be prepared mentally and physically to face the pandemic. And we have learned a lot of lessons from this pandemic. And we must build up our defense system, both in terms of personal health and the medical education, so that we can uh, add to the, uh, the lessons we have learned. And we should also analyze the lessons we missed out in the early phase of COVID. I mean, COVID has opened up millions of doors of uh, thinking, rethinking and thinking and forward thinking. I think we must take uh, lessons from the lesson learned by everyone. And uh, I appreciate Dr. Plexus for, Dr. Plexus for giving us opportunity and platform to discuss. Uh, it may look like a one tablet of vitamin D, but it has got a potential to uh, make um, changes every part of the body. Uh, this is a wonderful session. Thank you very much Thank to you. all the speakers. Thank you. And uh, I would request uh, Shetil to share the, uh, the this being recorded, the YouTube link, uh, so that we can also share in another platform where this uh, will be shared. And uh, as we discussed at the beginning, uh, this can be shared with the other doctor group in the uh, Dubai and other things, so that they can also be invited to join the uh, coming session. Okay. Thank you, sir. Thank you. Thank you. This uh, this brings us to the end of this session. Thank you so much to all the panelists for your time and effort in putting together this interesting session. To our dear viewers, uh, thank you so much for attending this session. Do share any more questions if you have. Until we see you again, take care and happy dog flexing. Thank you, everyone. Thank you, everyone. Thank, thank you. you. Thank you. Thank you. <laughs>